Nice to see so many people here who I recognise as uh, photographers who've uh, been to many of our different things and have also, we have quite a few distinguished faces in here as well, which is great, who've um, shown their work in uh, Hip Gallery and various other places. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. And uh, welcome to Hip Fest. Um, we are now first big day of all the workshops and talks and uh, I hope that you're going to be enjoying them all. There's plenty to come today. Hello, Marilyn Stafford. Hello. Your life to me, so far, seems to be a series of incredible happenstances, as uh, Jeff Brockett calls them. Yes. You just seem to um, somehow create these opportunities, or these opportunities just uh, provided by the universe, where you um, meet the most incredible people. True. And it just seems to have all started. So, from such an unusual place to end up where it is now. Because you didn't want to be a photographer, did you? No. Um, I started out um, thinking that I would become the great American actress because I was in a children's theatre group in Cleveland, Ohio, USA. I put the USA because I know there's a Cleveland somewhere up here. <laughs> and um, everybody says, you know, you're from Cleveland and they don't realize that it's over there. And uh, when I was a child, there was a big movement in the United States to um, separate Broadway, New York theater, uh, off into the country and make more community theaters. And so children were invited to my local theater group um, to participate and become the young apprentices of the next generation of actors and actresses. And there were quite a lot of important people that came from that children's group whose names you may not remember, but at least you'll know Paul Newman, who was pretty important stuff. So at a very early age, I thought that that was my direction because I didn't know anything else. I hadn't thought about it. I mean, who thinks about it when you're eight, nine years old? And um, it was really by, by chance that photography came into my life. Although, long ago and far away when I was a child, we all had box brownie cameras. I don't know if any of you ever knew of a box brownie camera. They were little tiny things, and they just went click and we got a picture. And so that was really where I started out, because every family had one, and we had one, and I liked taking pictures with it, but it was just part of life. It wasn't anything special. And then you had a, a kind of first chance meeting and, uh, and it ended up taking a photograph of Einstein. Ah, yes. Well, while I was in New York, um, as one did at the time, you, you touched everything because this was the big town coming from Cleveland, Ohio. And although we did have a big, wonderful and do still a modern uh, museum of art, very internationally known, but basically, when you went to New York, you were exposed to other things. And I met some people who were film people, and uh, they made documentary films. And they took me to the Metropolitan Museum that had a wonderful, wonderful cine club. And so I was exposed to early documentary filmmaking and wonderful old films. and the early Russian films, the Eisenstein films, and I might add, Eisenstein, I don't know if you know who he is, he was an early Russian filmmaker who wrote this wonderful, who directed this wonderful film, Ivan the Terrible, and there's this famous still of just snow and a long kind of trail like that of people marching and um, my friend Henri Cartier-Bresson used to be very influenced by him and Eisenstein when he was asked what do you do, what is the message to anybody who is making film and it was shoot, 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 cut, cut, cut. And that was what Cartier-Bresson said in terms of still photography and of course at the time 
I'm diverting, I hope you don't mind. I just seem to go off. Um, <laughs> Oh, so that's okay then, good. I mean, if you can follow me, it's early in the morning, you know, I usually don't get up until 11, because <laughs> I'm up all night. <laughs> anyway, um, taking photographs in the old days with film, it was literally running 36 frames through the camera, putting the thing in your pocket, and then you just kept taking pictures and you had lots and lots of rolls of film which you paid lots and lots of money to have processed and you had contact sheets and you looked at the contact sheets and then you paid lots of money to have the prints made up unless you did it yourself which I'm sorry to say I never did. So you met some people making contact sheets on? Yes. And, and you uh, have a car with them? Uh, yes. Uh, they were eager to make this it was in 1948. It was just before the American elections for president. And it was a very vibrant time in the United States. Lots of things were happening. On one hand, you had the rise of McCarthyism, which was horrifying, dangerous, and whose ugly head is still floating around us now. On the other hand, it was the end of the war, and there was hope, and there had been the bomb which ended the war, the atom bomb. And these documentary people wanted to make a film on Albert Einstein, who was then living in Princeton, New Jersey, and teaching at the university. And they wanted him to speak against the atomic bomb. And so they had arranged to go out to Princeton and to film him. And I was invited to come along. And in the car on the way, um, I was simply handed a 35 mil camera, which I'd never used before. And I'd always used a Rolleiflex, which is a bigger camera, bigger framed uh, picture. And the 35, of course, you looked at this way, whereas the Rolleiflex you looked at this way, and it was a totally different method of taking photographs, and that's somebody who was really not a photographer at the time. I was just given this camera in the back seat of the car and told, you are going to be the stills lady, and here's how you do it. We will set all of the lighting and shutters and everything for you. All you have to do is look through the lens, focus it, and click the button. And that was what I did. Absolutely listen to directions. And that's how I took Albert Einstein's photograph. After that, did you... Was there anything after that? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. This would be sure. <laughs> so, after that, did you think, I'm now a photographer, I feel like I want to take photographs, or did you just put it down and um, do something else? I, I didn't think anything about taking photographs, I really didn't. And uh, I must say that the uh, documentary on Einstein was very well done, and he <coughs> did speak out against the use of atomic weapons. And after that, um, sort of around the beginning of the following year, which was 49, um, I went to Paris. And it was in Paris that my life changed completely. Now, I'm right in thinking that you only went to Paris really because you were supporting a friend. And yes. Well, it sounded like it was fun. Yes. Well, actually, I mean, you can could, you could make up so many stories. And one of the stories I love is I went to Paris because of the infidelity of man. <laughs> and I think, I think that's a good story. My, my friend had been married to her husband for many years. And suddenly, one fine day, he finds out, she finds out that he was unfaithful. And she went to him and said, now, what are you going to do about this? And I'm terribly sorry to say, just like a man, he said, you go home to mother, and I will sort it out. <laughs> and she said, no way, no way, I'm not going home to mother. 
you are sending me to Paris, and I'm taking Marilyn with me, and you're paying for it. <laughs> she made him pay. And so the two of us bubbled off to Paris. So and that's how I really got there in the first place. I mean, it was infidelity. They found themselves in Paris. So we found ourselves in Paris, and... Um, I know you have a liking for cats. Did you, oh, yes. Did you have a cat in Paris? Oh, yes. I had uh, two cats in Paris. Um, I had one poor dear cat who I bought in one of those street markets. Beautiful little Siamese cat who was ill. And I took him to a vet. His name was Dr. Love. L-O-W-E, but in French it's, spelled, it's pronounced love. He was my long-term vet in Paris, and at one point I had, I had a cat and he delivered the cats. And I, he, he didn't have an assistant, so he said I would have to help deliver the cats, and I did. And they all come out in a sausage, I never knew this. <laughs> so you found yourself in Paris. Yes. You're delivering cats. I'm delivering cats. And then you started singing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I have to tell you back about Dr. Love, oh. because <laughs> it was very funny. When I got married to an Englishman in the mid-50s, sort of, um, I was still going to see Dr. Love with the cats. And um, I said, and I think he was doing something very serious to the cat. And I, I have it visually in my mind, there's the cat on the table and Dr. Love and me, and because he didn't have an assistant, I was assisting, and I said, Dr. Love, I'm going to get married. Ah, he said, oh, that's wonderful, who are you getting married to? So I said, an English journalist, and he threw his hands down on the table and he said, does anybody speak French? Oui. He said, depuis le temps que vous habitez en France, <laughs> which is, you know, since you've lived in France so long, how is it that you couldn't marry a Frenchman? And he was very irate about this. And I thought he would kill the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so you started singing? Well, the singing was a, a kind of, it was all woven in together all of this going with all the cats and vets and singing. I had met some Americans because it was post-war France, 1950, and a lot of Americans um, were going over to France, and a lot of soldiers who had been in France during the occupation or during the, uh, the end of the war. So people were kind of coming back, but it was still very early days, and Somebody had a birthday party, and we all sang happy birthday. And suddenly there was a, a gentleman appearing on my shoulder, and he said, excuse me, and he said this in French, I heard you sing happy birthday, and we're looking, I'm an agent, and I'm looking for somebody to sing with an ensemble. Would you be interested in auditioning? So I said, mm, sure, why not? So I went and auditioned, and I got this job. And it was a very interesting uh, job because it was in a very smart dinner club off the Champs Elysees, which was the only club that Princess Elizabeth was allowed to go to when she went to Paris. And it was very chic. It was not a nightclub, it was a dinner club. And that's where I met Bob Kappa. And he came in, and I became little sister. And Kappa would come in every night with his chums, and we would talk. About you feel? Well, while I was singing in the club, a, um, an American a chap called Eddie Constantine came in. And Eddie was there, he was a singer from the States. His wife was a ballerina with the Ballet des Champs-Élysées, and he was looking for a job singing, and he came and auditioned, and he got a job working with our ensemble. And he was translating songs into French, and he found an American song, and he went to see Edith Piaf, who was working in the Casino de Paris, which was up the Champs-Élysées, not far from us. And um, 
asked to see her, and she flipped over him. He became her lover. And so every night, after work, her work, she would come into our club and sit with her entourage around a big table, and then she would invite us home for breakfast. And there were a lot of people there because she had had this great love, Marcel Serdan, who was an international boxer. And he was from Morocco. And he had been killed in an airplane crash, which devastated her. And she did something very loving, which very few people would do. She went to Morocco and said to Marcel Serdan's wife, I loved your husband. You loved your husband. We should be mourning and loving together. And I want you to come to Paris and be with me. And so she brought the wife and the two children to Paris. So they were living in the house as well. And Charles Ausnebourg, who recently died, and Charles was part of the entourage who used to come in. And she was, um, I can't remember, there were many more people sitting around there. This is where another one of these crazy happenstances happens. Yes. You've got this history of doing photography, and in between you've delivered cats, you've sewn, you've met me here, <laughs> all of this happened getting married. You end up going back to cats, meet an American journalist, <coughs> and get some of the photography again. Yes, because I did not have any work at that time, and I didn't know what to do. And she was very generous and knew lots of people, and so she was doing stories. And she asked me if I'd like to take some pictures with her. And so I did. And, Which is uh, pretty much what happened in New York yeah. uh, when you ended up taking photographs of Einstein. Yes. Here you are again, the most unusual circumstances. Yes. And you're putting the same position down. <coughs> yes. You'd like to take some photographs. Yes. I suppose there's kind of a destiny in here, isn't there? Um, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's definitely a destiny in this. I, I, I don't know. You know, I don't. I say this all metaphorically, really. There is some kind of an energy. Some people say it's the angel on your shoulder. Whatever it is, it seems to keep coming back again, always. And so I worked with her, um, and she also helped me get a job because there was a necessity to work. And uh, I did get a job <coughs> with an agency um, uh, PR agency, and the person who owned the agency had clients who were uh, in the fashion, and that brings us to the exhibition upstairs, because her clients were both the fashion houses, which were high fashion, new ready to wear, as well as the fabric manufacturer, fabrics, through the designers and manufactured clothes. And so everything was holding together and I was sent out to photograph all of these new designers and new fashions <coughs> and new ready to wear, which is a new industry in France in the fifties. And you have all of the pictures that are upstairs that date from that period. Now that was possibly the most exciting development in fashion history. That yes. time mm -hmm. when we uh, moved to off the peg, you could call it, yes. and young designers yes. were challenging the old regime. In a sense they were, yes. Because if you lived in France, and even in England, women of money went to what were called maison de couture, or high fashion, houses. And they were literally that. They were big, beautiful um, buildings which the designers owned and which they used to present their line of fashion. And those garments were stunning. You could literally, they were, if you took a skirt, it was cut, it was lined, it was 
interlined and often had little weights on the bottom. The queen, when she has the, uh, her clothes made, it's always, I think, in the cardinal that did hers. They have little weights so when you're walking, the dress doesn't go up in the air. Things like that, very handcrafted, beautiful stitching, all done by hand, way up on the top of these beautiful, big, uh, historic buildings by what were called the petit man, the little hand, the dress, the seamstresses, all stitched by hand. The embroidery is stitched by hand. Every bead is put on by hand. It is admirable work. But in the 50s in France, coming out of the war, um, there was a young movement to do off the peg clothes. Now, they weren't cheap, but they were better than high fashion, and you could more or less, if you were middle class, you could afford it. Uh, up until that time, middle class people had their own dressmaker. So they would buy Vogue and all of those big fashion magazines, and they'd take the, the picture and say, this is what I want, and the little dressmaker would copy it. But now, young designers were coming up, and they were designing clothes for you and me, and hopefully at a price we could afford. So you had young designers, you had young manufacturers, a whole new industry was being built up. So there you are. And so there I was. Taking photographs of this happening. Of this happening. How did you feel, as a photographer, in that environment, with these incredibly crafted clothes, with these exciting changes, with the challenges of the designers. And there's you, Marilyn, mm. with a camera. Mm. How did that feel? Well, I was never into fashion as such. You know, I like nice clothes, but I never really was what they call a fashionista. And in a sense, it was, for me, earning a living more than, oh goody, I'm taking pictures of clothes. And I was also learning about Paris. And so when I had to take photographs of clothes, I was thinking, I don't like to shoot in a studio. I, can't be bothered with the technology of all that, the cords and the, and the, the things, electricity and lights and organizing. I can't stand that. And I don't like flash because I can't figure that out either. <laughs> and uh, so I just thought natural daylight, that's easy. <clears throat> I had already been informed how you organize if the light is like this and the buttons on the camera and I had after much effort learned how to do that but I really just wanted to go out and use existing light and because I was still exploring Paris and I loved the streets of Paris and it was new for me and these were clothes that were for women who would be walking the streets of Paris working, going to lunch with friends, being, you know, us, rather than ladies who went from one car to another and to one chic restaurant to another. It was a different life. And so I just took them out into my favorite spots in Paris and, and had fun. Now, to find those favorite spots? Well, I was exploring at the same time as I was taking pictures. I was cheating. <laughs> There's people out right now all over the whole city centre on photo walks as part of fitness. Yes. They're all going out taking photographs on the street. Lovely. You were going around the streets of Paris doing this. How, how did that feel? And what, what were you thinking when you were going out with the camera? And what did people think of you walking around with the camera? Well, there were two things. One thing was photographing fashion. The other was going out in the streets taking photographs, which was more my feeling because 
I am interested in documentary photography as a means of telling a story which I feel needs to be told. And that is where my heart is. So I was combining the two, if you will, um, putting together the story of young women wearing clothing that was to be sold and uh, telling stories of what was happening in the street. First of all, Paris, a young woman with a camera, an expensive item, walking around. That couldn't have gone unnoticed. No, you're quite right. Um, it, again, post-war Paris, few people did have cameras. And I have had the opportunity to meet uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson uh, very early on in the 50s. And as I said, his advice was, go out and shoot. So I used to, to hone my own kind of work, uh, get on a bus in the morning and go to the end of the line and get off at the end of the line and walk about and uh, photograph whatever was photographable. Uh, something quite memorable was getting off at the Bastille and seeing a little alleyway and I didn't know what it was and I felt a little like going down the rabbit hole and found myself in a rather derelict, once beautiful Edwardian center of town. It was a, 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 it, it was a slum, a terrible slum, which had over the years, it had been built in Edwardian times, it was now housing immigrants, uh, refugees, very small businesses, glove makers, small woodworking uh, enterprises. And uh, it was a rather sad place. But I was just wandering around and suddenly kids popped up. And kids pop up, and when they pop up, they are following you, and kids are marvelous, and they brought life to the whole thing, and I photographed all the kids, and had a marvelous time, and left. I did not realize I was in the worst slum, and this slum was taken down by the French, by Paris uh, local government in 1984, and the new French uh, opera Bastille was built on that site. And what is so very exciting is that uh, those pictures were shown in an exhibition in Toronto and they're on my website as well. And things converge and people who I photographed, kids, are coming forth. That's me. And we've got one little boy who's living, he's now an adult, he's retired, he was, he's living in the south of France, and, and the lady in Connecticut in the United States said, that's my brother, and she got in touch with me. It's so exciting how all of this is coming together again. Yes, it is. Very exciting how it's all coming together again. And there is so many more of these happenstances these yes. that we could talk about uh, that have led you to take different photos in different yes. places. But I just want to go back to one thing you mentioned. Yes. Cartier Bresson. Yes. Did he say anything to you that was useful apart from shoot, shoot, shoot? <laughs> you know, he, he didn't really. <laughs> You'll be waiting for that, right? <laughs> no, I mean, I would take him photographs, and he would look at them, and he'd, he 
he would just simply say it would look better if you did this or if you did that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he didn't say do this and do that. In fact, he never said it would look better. He would suggest that maybe. You know, he was never dogmatic at all. Did he influence you much? If so, well, he did because he he opened my eyes. You could sit with him like we're sitting. Let's say he's Carty Bresson. He has a 35 mil camera here. There's your camera. And we're talking. And he's looking at me, and his eyes are all around the room, and he's seeing over there somebody's doing something. And he just, a little like this, just while he's talking to you. <laughs> incredible, just incredible. He invited me up. He was married at the time to an Indonesian dancer. And um, they would often invite me to dinner at their house. And uh, very often I went out with him in groups of people. And he was really very kind. And when I went to Tunisia in 1958 to photograph refugees, I did take him uh, the photographs I had taken. And he very generously sifted through and sent them to the Observer. And the, the Observer published two of those photographs on their front page, and that was my very first front page. And uh, that was a big moment. You went to London. And, um, that was in the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. Very exciting time there in London as well. Mm -hmm. Everything that was going on, changes in fashion. Absolutely. Uh, you took photographs of uh, Twiggy, Joanna Lumley. What was that like? They were lovely people. Very lovely people, and still are. Um, I was, by that time, working for an American fashion newspaper. And so these were all assignments. And uh, Lumley was taken in the uh, showroom of a marvelous designer called Jean Muir. I don't know if you know who she was, but she was a beautiful designer. And Joanna Lumley was young. She was modeling. And she was a great model. And uh, Twiggy was, I photographed, there was a, a photo call. And again, I think it was for the, one of these newspapers I was working for. And uh, I never really met her, uh, but uh, just photographed her. And you, took, uh, you know, at this event, protocol. And you took photographs of uh, Biba. Yes. Does anybody here remember Biba? No. no. Good. Because, you know, we're talking generation gap here. And I have found that some of my friends don't know what I'm talking about. Or, you know, they, they don't relate to it because they, it wasn't part of their life. And if you're 30 years old, you don't know what I'm talking about. Well, there's one particular photograph in the Viva section of the... It's the last... It's the second to last photograph in the exhibition of mm -hmm. There's a woman in the photograph mm -hmm. wearing a hat almost blending into the wallpaper with the yeah, absolutely. There's another woman in the background smoking a cigarette. Irony. Yeah, it's an irony. Right. <laughs> yes. And then there's dogs eating the clothes, eating the clothes. on the floor. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> love it. When you were taking that photograph, was that, was it one of those Cartier-Bresson moments of thinking, I'll just click that? Or did, what were you thinking when you took the photograph? Dogs eating clothes, somebody playing it? I don't know. I, th I think probably all of that, if you, if you see the photograph, you'll notice that the wallpaper is so all over the place, and the clothes are so all over the place, and I was, you know, I, I couldn't tell one thing from another. It was kind of, everything was going on so much, 
And I honestly just kept shooting. I think, you know, that's all you can do. You just say, let yourself go. I mean, I was obviously trying to get what was going on. But, I mean, you know, it all happens very fast. And you just, you're there and you're, you're observing and you're clicking and you, that's it. And you said earlier that you don't have a lot of equipment. No. Or setups or no. studios or no. all these things. Is, does that go as far as a camera? Is a, it, does a camera get in the way? Yes. If I could take it without a camera, it would even be better. <laughs> <laughs> One last thing I want to talk about, and that is that you were a young woman in London taking photographs. It was in the 60s and 70s, the time of great change, just for um, women in, in society in England. Um, what was it like to be make, trying or pursuing making a living and a career as a woman photographer in a male-dominated society at that time? When I came to London in, in the mid-60s, there were 10 or 12 women photographers on Fleet Street, mainly photographing um, feature photographs rather than news. I think there were two news photographers on Fleet Street. And the features were the kind of things where the editor would say, you know, go out and photograph the Downs, or go and photograph Cornwall, or something. It was a lovely picture. It wasn't documentary photography, which is, or even press photography, which is what the men did, go out and photograph the picket line, go and photograph what's going on today uh, at, at here. And it took quite a long time for more women to make their way into uh, photography. My area is an interest is mainly photo documentary work. And I want to tell a story and show what the story is about. And usually what interests me is changing the world and making it a better place. And I feel that there are a lot of stories that need to be told. And there are a lot more women now who are working. They're up against a lot of problems. Uh, first of all, I was very fortunate because we had a trade union, the National Union of Journalists. So there was a, at least a minimum wage that they could not go under. It may be that the women got paid less than the men, but nonetheless, not like today, where you are told you're going to get paid way under that, or you don't work. I mean, even men are at that problem. So uh, I think that today, um, with the fact that there are more women working, uh, they have the added problems of family and children, and have always had this problem. Uh, I it shouldn't be called a problem, it is what it is. And I feel that there are so many good women photographers out there, and they should be shown. And in 2017, with the support of my friend Nina Emmett and her wonderful organization, Photo Document, uh, we set up the 
Marilyn Stafford Photo Award for Women Documentary Photographers, who had a story to tell and a possible solution to offer to show what was being done for this situation or what might be done. And it was shot in the dark. Um, I took a little bit of money from my savings, my meager savings, and we started it. And my thinking was, let's do it and see what happens. We can always do group funding or throw a party or something next year. I didn't think ahead. We just didn't. And we were very fortunate the following year to get Olympus on board to support us, which means that our panel of very fine women judges are getting paid, organizers are getting paid, and the prize for the first winner has gone up. And that is terrific because it means that either the woman who is shooting can pay somebody to take care of the kids, or can pay somebody to open doors for her wherever she's going into an area that may be dangerous, have a little protection, and at least get help with this project. And Olympus has been wonderful because they have a gallery now in London, and they're actually going to show and have shown the winner's photographs. So we're helping women photographers, and I feel that that's important. There's so many other things I could ask you about. I could ask you about the entire day with Gandhi, about Lebanon, and, and all of these different things that you've done. But maybe that's for another interview. Yes. One last thing. Then. Yes. You've got an exhibition of your fashion photography in a designer fashion outlet in a shopping centre in Hull. <laughs> Putting that in a shop amongst all the designer clothes, what is, the, what is that like? It was, is it a crazy idea? or? I think it was genial of you. It's all him. Because <laughs> when I was... At, it is, you had to it agree. Is, no, no, no. You know, I'm, I just take pictures, and I can't think of all of these things. And you were so genial. I, you, you have a selection of photographs. And to make a fashion thing in, in a fashion place is so obvious, so, so wonderful. I never would have thought of it. And I thank you for thinking of it. it. It's a beautiful exhibition. If anybody hasn't seen it, it is so lovely what he has done. And I thank you very much, Alan. I'm so pleased with it. I'm, I'm just simply over the moon. On that, I have to say that the photography festivals are terrible without the photographs, so thank you. <laughs> um, one thing on that, there is a hope by having these photographs in here, in Hull, in a shopping centre where people can come across them and see them, that it may influence young photographers, new photographers, um, to maybe get involved. What, what, what's your hope for people who come to see this? By having this here, what would you like to have happen? Well, I think that it's not just photographers. It was interesting, some of the comments that women especially made to me about the sort of way the women composed themselves in the 1950s, the way they stood, the way their bodies were. There was much more dignity in a sense. A lot of the women said to me they felt there was much more dignity than in this flashy 60s, which of course was younger. It was a younger movement. So, you know, one has to balance that. But it was very interesting 
to see, to hear some of the women comment on the attitude of women, uh, toward women in the 60s liberation and the more staid comportment of the earlier period. And I don't know if this has anything to bear on anything, but uh, it was an interesting comment. It's nice that it started a conversation. Absolutely. And I, I really was so pleased that people liked the pictures. Really so pleased. They've been in boxes under the bed. You know, I mean, the things I, I photographed, I thought, well, that's, that's it. You know, I was going, I've thrown away a lot of it because I thought nobody would be interested. And uh, the fact that they're, they're now being salvaged is of slight amazement to me. And I'm, I'm simply delighted and happy that people like to see them. Well, on that note. And thank you <laughs> for showing them. <laughs> and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Margaret Stafford, for being here in Hull, for letting us enjoy your photographs, you. and for starting the conversation. Uh, now that people are able to see them engage with them and talk to each other about them. Thank you, Margaret Stafford.